Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. We thought drivers were more competitive coming into this, but we we found out very early on that there was a huge sense of camaraderie at the you know each uh, at the hyper local level, each individual city. The drivers were collaborating, communicating with each other, because they realized that no one driver can keep up with everything that's going on. Hey everybody, it's Scott. It's Wednesday, and it's a Pitchworks podcast. Thanks as always for tuning in. This week, I've got Ryan Green. He's from a company called Gridwise, and they're doing really cool stuff, especially if you have anything to do with the ride sharing economy and ecosystem. But before I let you find out all of the secrets of making more money being a driver, I gotta ask you to subscribe to this fine program, if only because it is the one thing I ever care about is just expanding my empire. Uh, jump into the uh, podcast app of your choice, click the subscribe button, and then all of our episodes will be delivered to you auto-magically every Wednesday morning, way earlier than everybody gets it. It's a small perk, you know, just to make sure that, you know, you're properly compensated for the extra effort that I'm asking you to spend right now. So let's talk to Ryan. Ryan's got some really cool peacock feathers behind him too. Uh, Company started out in Alpha Lab. They moved on to Techstars Mobility. I mean, big stuff has happened for him already, and I, I can only see that getting bigger as we go. Ryan Green, how are you? I'm doing good. Sorry to jump right out at you there, but uh, I don't know. I have, a, I have a somewhat, shall we say, irreverent set of things I want to start off with telling you. Okay. I have a bone to pick with you. Here's what it is, right? I've been to your website. I did extensive research on sort of like how you present your ideas and all that sort of thing. And I've got to say, I've never had a driver that looks like the guy on the front page. <laughs> that is that is a young version of the Do- Dos Equis guy, the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> like, I don't know if he lost his contract and now he's driving, but that guy is really well polished. <laughs> You gotta take some more. Uh, you gotta take some rides in Miami. Maybe you'll, you'll come across. He's smooth, man. I'm telling you what. You, everybody go to Gridwise.io and just check this guy out. The beard. I mean, he's just everything's on point. Um, I, I I think we got a lot of, a lot to talk about, and I want to start off with the very basics to make sure we don't lose anybody along the way. Yeah. Um, tell everybody just what Gridwise is to start the ball rolling. Yeah, so when we're we're looking at Gridwise, I think a little context can help. Is um, so essentially, I'm I'm sure you're aware of uh, you know what rideshare is. When yes. you're looking at services such as Uber and Lyft and and uh, Z Trip and the, the other services that operate in the space, is um, when we break those services down into two segments. There's the rider side, right, and the driver side. Yeah. Um, so Gridwise is focused on the driver side. Mm-hmm. Is we are focused. We provide a mobile application to the drivers that helps them increase their earnings an average of thirty nine percent by helping them know when and where to drive. That's a good number. <laughs> it's a good number. Thirty nine percent increase in earnings, no matter who you are. I mean, nobody's going to say no to that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, we say it's a no brainer. And uh, when drivers are drivers use our apps because the the challenge that they have is when they're out on the road is they're. They're constantly, you know, before they hit the road, they're trying to understand when is the best time for, for me to drive? When should I be out on the road based off of my personal schedules, my personal preferences, and, uh, you know, the services I'm driving for? Uh, but once they're out on the road, it's understanding, okay, I've, I've dropped a passenger off and I'm looking for a ride. Where should I go next? I've just taken a passenger to the suburb. Should I go back to the city? Should I go to the airport? Should I stay where I am? Um, you know, these it's questions gambling a little bit right? in you, some way. Yeah. And, and so you're, you don't get guidance, do you? Like, I mean, I'm asking, I've never driven. Like, do they tell them like, this might be a good place for you to go? Is that the experience? There's, there's not a lot of help out on the road. It's it, essentially the drivers feel like they're driving around blind. Uh, right. Occasionally, um, you know, the service providers will provide some kind of information of, you know, surge pricing, uh, that's going on in the city, but it's very real time. It's very creating a reactive nature uh, for the drivers as they're out on the road. And so what we really focus on is helping them really be aware of all the drivers of, uh, or all the factors of, uh, that uh, relate to opportunities out on the road, understanding, helping them better understand what's happening in the city around events, when they're letting out, when they're starting, 
um, airport traffic, uh, passengers coming in and out of the airports, uh, demand at Amtrak and Greyhound stations, and uh, and nice. anything that's uh, really indicative of opportunity for them. But I, I think what's important is you you have these um, things that kind of depict demand or where riders may be at, clues. Uh, if you will, clues. Uh, Not in guarantees, the market. but clues. Clues and. But what's also important is understanding where other drivers positioning themselves, um, which is kind of the supply side of the market. Um, so combining, uh, uh, we provide a lot of different information. We send out uh, to help drivers plan ahead for the next couple of hours or a couple of days uh, for when they should be out on the road. We help them know where to drive next uh, as they're in between rides. And we're sending out a lot of uh, various types of alerts, helping them know uh, what you know when this event's ending in the next thirty minutes, or it's going to rain in the next fifteen minutes. All of these things are impacting their revenue. It's Absolutely impacting it how effective they are. I'm more likely road. to take a ride share if it's raining. Exactly. Fact. Exactly. You 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 might have been riding your bike or going to ride a bike, and then the weather just changed your behavior. Or just, and, yeah, I mean, just looking at. Well, I'm not sure that I want to spend as much time because I know how slow other drivers are, <laughs> and. What would have normally been a 15 minute ride becomes a 25 minute ride. Hey, I could do some emails in the back of a, of an Uber. It, exactly. There's a lot of different ways that that influences it. Now yes. you're pulling all this data in mm -hmm. and I heard weather and I heard events mm -hmm. and I heard transit travel. So you're talking about, um, air travel. You said Amtrak, those kinds of things. Building that had to have been the first challenge, right? And then the second piece becomes how do we, how do we make it presentable? Because we, we're still te we're dealing with a, a user that's behind the wheel. Correct. Or parked on the side of the road. Correct. So now you've got a UI sort of a challenge where it's like, how do we not cause too much information? Or, or how, do we, how do we avoid the, the bit where they just avoid it altogether, right? Because I mean, mm -hmm. if it's a tool that you don't use, it's a useless tool, right? Exactly. How did you go through that process? It's an interesting process. Uh, is I mean, that was the thing coming into this and, and working with this demographic is there was a lot of different challenges in looking at this. Is like one is like a, there's so much data that we're pulling is like you you couldn't just you know expose all this information and, and it, it, it's not digestible. Expect someone to to understand that exactly. Right. There's so there's a lot of work in the back end to to make uh, to process that information and, and display it in a, in a user friendly way. But you, you you made a good point is is the fact that drivers are they're driving on the road like this is yeah. a we don't want to make driving more dangerous. We need to make it safer as they're out there. I'm assuming kind of, that the driver is safe. But I do think that part of making more money is not spending too much time reading the data, but instead acting on the thing that the data tells you to do, mm -hmm. right? So you needed a UI that says like, okay, you're X distance from Y event. Yeah? Correct. Something's quick. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people who have like literally spent their careers trying to take <laughs> huge data stores and boil them down. Yeah. So, did you bring people in for that? Did you have to hire for that? Or there is was, that more of a, just talk to the users and ask them what they want? You know, it was, uh, you know, very humble beginnings as we came into this is just figuring out, we had to figure out what information do drivers really care about and what information is really going to help, you know, impact their earnings the most and, right. and, and understand where do we start. And in doing so, we, we from the early days of the company to validate this before we even dedicated tons of engineering resources to build the mobile applications, is we our first service was a weekly email and text messages that we sent every day. I love everything about that. <laughs> no, because it's it proves it before the major investment. Exactly. And so we wanted to make sure that we were, you know, we, if you think of the, the lean startup methodology and going through and making sure that you develop this MVP that really helps to validate your assumptions before you go out and, and build your vision, right? right. And, and that's just a, a, a constant iterative process over time. And so like, what's the sucky version of this? Yeah. <laughs> and let's see if it's useful, even when it's sucky. Right? Yeah, you know, it's like, a, this thing's ugly and stupid, but it works. Exactly. And, and, and so that's where, that's where we started. And that's where we learned is like, we were pulling in some data and we started providing, presenting it in different ways. We were testing a lot of different ways to, to alert drivers as they're out on the road. And that really, you know, going through that exercise and going through that, that first version of the product to really validate what's built. Like, helped us understand what what sources to to put into the application. 
how to position them. How are drivers planning ahead? How are they uh, reacting to this as they're out on the road? And so it's a combination of that, talking to your users, getting yeah. lots of feedback. And what we started to, you know, one of the most insightful things of going through that, that we would have never known is the fact that when we would text drivers and alert them on areas of peaking demand, they would text us back and they would tell us to, they would text us things like, hey, well, this event's letting out here or there's traffic on this highway and things that weren't in our system or that we didn't know about. And they wanted us to share that with other drivers. It becomes a community thing. Exactly. Right. It really caught us off guard. We thought drivers were more competitive coming into this, but we saw, we found out very early on that there was a huge sense of camaraderie at the, you know, each uh, at the hyper local level, each individual city, the drivers were collaborating, communicating with each other because they realized that no one driver can keep up with everything that's going on. So if you can communicate and can contribute and crowdsource information that you know and expect others to do the same, uh, they, they're going to pay it back. Well, I mean, there's a reason why the new saying is that data is the new oil, right? Like everyone yeah. has that saying like right on the tip of their tongue for a reason. Yeah. It's because it's so inf infinitely useful, right? If, if all these drivers have access to the data, the machine is more, it, it's better... We're going to, oh God, we're going to go there. It's better <laughs> lubricated, right? It's got, it's got data in it and data is oil. God, I, I thought I should have thought that through before I started moving my lips is what should have happened. Um, but legit, uh, you've got this, this, you know, driver ecosystem, which everyone benefits if it's efficient. Along those lines, what kind of relationships do you have with the ride share services? Like, do they know of your existence and do they care about you being there? Yes. So they, they definitely know about our existence and, you know, we have contacts within all of them. Um, so we've worked with them in, in various ways and, and really what, what we've built over time is this interesting distribution channel of drivers at, you know, in each individual city. Um, and our product uh, to kind of call out is, is service agnostic. And what I mean by that is that we're not valuable to just Uber drivers. Right. We're valuable to Lyft drivers and Z Trip and Via and Get and Juno, any and of the services people, these drivers right? yeah. drive for. Exactly. At the end of the day, you know, we see is we're we're this independent service. We're essentially a layer on top of all the rideshare services. And, and, but there's and, somebody inside one of those companies going, if we just buy Gridwise, we've got it. <laughs> you know it, right? If we just buy them and bake it into our existing driver app, then we've got. I assume there's IP here. I assume there's other different things that yeah. you've got that they feel like they could wall out. You know, I think there's interesting opportunities down the road um, with a lot of different types of companies. But I, I think f from us and the value we add to to the rideshare companies is that, you know, retention has been a, a, a major challenge for them. And, and just being able to incentivize drivers to drive when they need them to yeah. and to go where they want them to. And so Gridwise fills a lot of the gaps there. We're providing a very compelling experience that keeps drivers driving, that gets more drivers on the road, and that gives them more tools or, or equips them uh, better to perform out on the road as right. they're driving. Um, and so like we see that there's there's definitely a lot of benefits there uh, and and things that we do that are value add. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunities down the road. You've got this coy look on your face. I love it. And, and, <laughs> and that's all. I'm not going to push you any harder. So if I'm a driver, what does this cost me? Uh, our app is actually free for drivers. Okay. Mm -hmm. So who's paying the bill? Who's paying the bill? Um, so we work with other uh, affiliate partners who uh, advertise through us uh, mm -hmm. to rideshare drivers. And uh, the rideshare drivers, again, the core of the product is always going to be free. We yeah. may introduce a more premium version down the road. But that's I kind of figured that's where you were headed. That's something we're exploring yeah. now, um, but it's not in stone. Uh, we, we do see the value in, in focusing on you know adding dollars into driver's pockets and not taking away from them. Um, so that's something we're continuously exploring. Um, well, I, and then I, we, I, there's, a, there's a premium level of, of driver though, right? And when mm -hmm. I say driver now, I, I need to get a little bit clearer, right? When I travel, I see sometimes like a limousine company mm -hmm. will be affiliated, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which isn't the same as a driver, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I'm using those two words interchangeably and maybe it makes it confusing. So what, I guess what I'm saying is there's a next tier up that may be very interested in a premium service yeah. because it's more about dealing with all of their drivers that are all subscribed under their flag. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. Okay. Yeah. I, 
And I might have hit you too hard on that question. Just be like, okay, Ryan, well, you know. <laughs> where's the money at? Where's the money at? But, <laughs> but you know that's, look, I know it without even asking you, but I have to just through the purposes of due diligence have to ask you, right? Isn't that the thing that people ask you when you say it's free? It's every time. Yeah. It's like Facebook too, yeah. right? Like they're yeah. like, you are the product, <laughs> right? There's certain cliches that are just never going to die. That's yeah. one of them, right? Yeah. Um, so if if I don't have to pay to use it, and I get a 39% increase in what I can make. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, it's a no brainer to use the service, right? Yes. I think people like you and I see the efficiency as a rising tide that lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. I can see some drivers being worried about, you know, just getting theirs and not so much caring about the community. Yeah. But the feedback doesn't lie. You already said these drivers wanted to contribute tips. They wanted to contribute intelligence. Some of them get it. They understand that a better operation means a happier city full of users, which means more people are likely to just call it on a whim. Mm -hmm. The impulse purchase is good for everybody. Like, I get it. And when you explain it to somebody that's driving a car, I like the idea of showing them that pile up of Ubers at, I don't know, Orlando <laughs> airport, where they're just all sitting around there wasting their lives waiting for their turn. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that's what's, uh, you know, it's, it's great to have features in the product that are showing how drivers, like we bring real driver identities into the platform and show, you know, if you contribute information, we show your identity, we show who's behind this, who's contributing nice. this information and other drivers can see who's collaborating. And that really helps other drivers see like, okay, well, this... I've seen this person around the airport a lot. Like I can contribute what the supply is at the airport or something like that. And so we're, I think drivers are really starting to realize it's like, there's not, we're not paying them cash to contribute information. We're not, there's not a lot of incentives at this point in time is outside of the sole sense of purpose that drivers get out of helping one another. So I know it wasn't the only place that you went, but you were at uh, Alpha Lab for a while. Correct. Um, which is a great program. I love the Alpha Lab folks. Yeah, Alpha great. Lab, Alpha Lab gear, you know, really interesting things. Um, what did you take away from that experience? What did I take away? There was a lot of things. It was, it was really, you know, the inception of our, we started a company through the Alpha Lab program. Right. And so, you know, learning everything from the ground up of how to form your company into how to get to, you know, this get a product out in the market and start getting feedback. And so that that's where I, I think the program was very, uh, in, you know, very paramount in helping us to really reel things back a little bit and not try to build our vision from the start Yeah, and focus in and hone in on that email and text message service that I mentioned. And so there was a lot of great feedback from, you know, people like Jim Jen and Aaron Tainer mm -hmm. uh, and everyone who, all the mentors who were involved with the program that were really helping us, you know, think through what that MVP looks like. How do we not only put that MVP out, but iterate on that over time and start to develop or get feedback and then improve the product over time to get to the mobile app we have today. That makes sense. And honestly, I love that answer it, because I don't think people necessarily think of that as the answer that you would give, right? Mm -hmm. I, um, I think a lot of times people make the assumption that a program like that is designed to give them money and then shut up. <laughs> and you went on uh, Techstars Mobility, what, 17? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Techstars Mobility is a, by the way, congratulations on that. That's no small feat. Thank you. Uh, you got there, if I'm right, you and I haven't spoken on this, so I might be wrong, but you got there because you learned how to learn in the early stages. And then your evolution was more deliberate and slower and proven by data. Correct. Correct. I mean, it was, it was because of, you know, the foundation we had built when we were in Alpha Lab and yeah. after Alpha Lab is, is getting our, our, you know, building the mobile app, getting that in the wild and actually launching into other markets and growing those markets and showing that we had, you know, some market validation, there was traction there. There was a lot of momentum in the company. We had a, a fairly strong team that we had built, a core team that we built at that time. And, uh, you know, all of those things and probably, you know, many more variables contributed to us being accepted into that program. Yeah. You proved that in a, in a relatively short amount of time with a relatively small team, you could make something with a large disproportionately sized value. Mm -hmm. And that let people see that like, okay, these guys are doing it right. You know, there's a, there's a methodology here and it's deliberate and it's, it compounds off of its successes from yesterday as opposed to just trying to build Rome in a day. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
because now all of a sudden with those kinds of, you know, laurels around your names, now the bigger fish are going to start to circle, right? Uh, now people want to come for your company, whether it be to like put a big check into it or mm-hmm. acquire it or, mm-hmm. or whatever. And I have to believe just based on, and you've got this demeanor. Don't take this the wrong way, right? <laughs> because you got a very cool demeanor. And I don't mean cool like the Fonz. I mean cool like you don't rattle. And you're the kind of CEO I like to invest in because of that. Because if you're going to freak out about every little tremor, then what are you going to do when an earthquake actually hits? Mm -hmm. Like you've run out of responses, (laughs) right? Um, So I guarantee just based on that, the vibe you send me from across the table, Mm -hmm. other smarter, richer people (laughs) have noticed that same vibe and have probably started pulling chairs up to listen to what you have to say. Is that about right? Yeah, you could say that. But yeah, I, I mean, I feel I feel very uh, appreciative, and, and it's been you know just an amazing experience and humbling to have you know these very powerful and influential influential people uh, who have invested and in, are part of Gridwise and part right. of the investor team, and that's one of you know outside of the core team of the company who's you know operationally focused and in building out Gridwise is it's just been amazing to have so many smart and talented uh, investors on board who have also been key advisors for right. us. That, as I love that the when they can add something too, right? They've seen that fish before and they can help you with it. Exactly. Yeah. What other characteristics do you look for when someone says, I want to get involved? Whether mm-hmm. it be an investor, somebody who wants to intern for you, you know, the whole gamut. Gotcha. Yeah. I think in, in looking at that is like you, you mentioned, okay, well, it's a given that maybe you probably want them to understand your industry. I would take it a higher level up and it's, it, I want to look at their relevancy of not only just the industry and mobility, but also it's like maybe they weren't operating in mobility, but they've built out a, a similar type of product that it, it, they they've gained really deep expertise and knowledge of, or that they've you know really killed in marketing in in, a, in executing on a marketing strategy that may be similar to ours in a completely different business. Yeah, and and so I think is looking at you always want to look for that smart money, not people who just uh, are going to invest and, and kind of, you know, sit in the background, but people who are going to invest and bring strategic value across, you know, various functions of the business. And so we, we look for, the, we look for that uh, in any of the, you know, assessments of investors uh, that we, that we're reaching out to, but also people that are, you know, a lot of people have this preconceived notion that when you're, pitching to investors that it's really just you talking to the investors and them deciding to invest in you, but you, it's gotta be both ways is, is you're kind of, you're dating. You're like, you're about to get married. If you're doing the right thing, you are. Exactly. I don't know that everybody follows your advice, but I think that that's how it should be. It should be. It should be. You should be asking uh, tons of questions about how this investor works with their portfolio companies. How are they involved? What are they, what are, you know, are they more operationally involved? Are they kind of more passive? They like to write a check and it's in the background. And, you know, not every investor is going to be super actively involved with the company, which is right. okay. Um, but they may have a, a great network who they can introduce you to. And so you're trying to really understand is what is the, the value that that investor brings to the table outside of just money. Yeah. If we go back to the accelerator programs that we went into, uh, that, that we got into, is the most valuable thing that came out of those programs was not the money. Of course not. We, we, got, uh, you know, Techstars gives a, a, a nice, uh, a great size of investment, $120,000 to join the program. Alpha Lab is a smaller check, as uh, but they give you some initial seed capital as well. But the, the value comes from the program and the, from the network you that you build. cannot buy confidence. Exactly. You cannot buy it. No, you can't. And, and to, to, to expand on your whole, you know, dating, you know, it, because I agree with you, mm-hmm. but here's the thing. I think it's way more intense than dating because marriage, at least love can bail you out sometimes, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> like, well, you know, she drives me insane, but I love her, right? That's different than we're never going there, right? Like you're not even allowed to know what my children's names are. <laughs> I'm an investor. You have a, a business. I'm invested in your business. Yeah. Love can't bail you out of a bad relationship when it yeah. comes to, to startups and investments. Yeah. Uh, as you look at that sort of, I, I'm looking for expertise, even if it's not necessarily the same kind of expertise, like the industry expertise. Um, do you feel like you've got a recipe where you can tell who's telling the 100% truth and who's kind of putting you on? 
you know, after talking to hundreds of investors, I think it's it's gotten to a point where you start to you can get a sense of that person off the bat. And if, you know, are is it a really, vibe though, or is it, it is, something you can see? Like they have, like they have patterns of behavior. There is a, there is a vibe. It's also the patterns of behavior is like when you're communicating with them is how active are they in, in actually delving into what they're requesting from you? We've had many investors who you, you want to, you know, the, the biggest thing you want to try to do when you're raising money is, is get to, you know, a decision as soon as possible, as fast as possible. You get a lot of investors who, may string you along for quite some time. And, and so that's a challenge to get around. But you, early on, you can see, okay, if I'm going to send this person this information that they're requesting, uh, then ask questions about, you know, what did, what were your thoughts in reviewing this, this types of, of things? There's in, other sales, tools. in sales, we call this a false objection, right? Someone's trying to find an excuse to get out of the deal. Mm-hmm. So they ask you for something, knowing that it'll probably take you a while to put it together. But they're not that invested in what happens next because what they're really trying to do is go, you know, I don't love your answer or it took you too long to put it together or yeah. whatever. Like the false objection reveals a lot about the counterparty. It re- reveals a lot about sort of like this person doesn't have money or this person never intended to participate. What they wanted was competitive intelligence because they're thinking about investing in something that is in our space or mm-hmm. is competing with us or they represent a, you know, an interest that's completely unrelated and they just saw us as a good place to mine for, you know, valuable time saving data, right? Yeah. So as I as I look at this now, I and I I'm just gonna hit you right between the eyes with it. I don't remember having ever seen grid wise in one of the cars that I was in, right? Okay. That doesn't mean that I know anything, right? Does it feel right that the passenger should know? Because I don't think I would know, Mm -hmm. but it does seem like if I were a passenger in a car and there were a little sign on the back of the seat headrest or something that said, congratulations, this vehicle has been optimized by Gridwise. Mm -hmm. Congratulations may be coming on a little (laughs) strong, right? I think that's where cool. you're going. I see where you're going. I don't know if that's useful to you. Take it for free. I'm not going to charge you. I just like the idea. It it is. Uh, I think it is a good. I mean, anything you can do to create brand awareness because what we've seen is that when passengers do know, they tend to I mean, everyone ask engages about with it. their drivers, but they ask, "Hey, are you using this?" And how this many tool? times can you ask your driver how long you've been driving? <laughs> exactly. Like, how many times does that guy answer that phone, that, that <laughs> same question every day? Every so, day. how long you been doing this? Oh God, 12,000 years, apparently <laughs> only part-time. <though. laughs> um, and that's, uh, I mean, and so we've recognized that. I mean, that's been helpful for riders knowing that in, you know, the different markets we operate in yep. through different reasons, but we're, we're working on some other implementing some other campaigns that are going to get more awareness on the vehicles. Um, so you'll see those constantly riding around the city. Follow me down a rabbit hole just for a second. Yeah. So What's the number one fear that you're going to, when you hail a, you know, an Uber or a Lyft or even a cab, like just a regular old cab, what's the number one fear? Number one fear for me personally? Yes. As a consumer. I mean, I'm a, my, my answer is not going to be the, the, the same as a normal person, it. but it's going to be that they're not using grid wise. It's like, okay, that's, uh, that's kind of my, I mean, at, at this you're point, right. that's the, not a normal answer. So I'm going <laughs> to give you, I'm going to show you what a normal answer looks like. Yeah. Ready? I'm worried I'm going to get a psychopath. Right, yeah. I'm worried that some person who it doesn't pay attention and doesn't really care about this hates this job and does it as poorly as possible is behind the wheel, and I'm gonna die from it. Yeah. Okay. The, I think that's a more valid answer. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying. I wanted you to get a good feel of it. You know, smell the seats of that particular answer. Right. Yeah. Now, if that's my concern, how do I fix it? When you first get into my vehicle and put someone at ease, the answer is prove that you're a professional. Mm -hmm. I want to work with pros no matter what I'm doing, Mm -hmm. right? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I I could have cuffs put on my pants at the dry cleaners, but that feels a little weird, Mm -hmm. right? I'll go to a tailor. I want a pro at at all levels. And that's why I was suggesting, like, if a a driver is using Gridwise, it proves that they care and they, they take this seriously. I think if you want to be cynical and be devil's advocate, you could go, oh no, it just proves that they want to make more money. But mm-hmm. I don't think that that's 
being fair. I think it's a way that we boil it down to help people understand why they want to keep listening to the pitch. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> why should I listen to your pitch, Ryan? Cause I'm going to make you 40% more money than you were making <laughs> yesterday. All right. You have my rapt attention, sir. Right. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> oh, hang on. This is relevant to my interests. Um, <laughs> but past that, that passenger wants to know that you care about this, that, mm-hmm. you know, this is a business to you and that, Bad things are not likely to happen here unless they're purely by just unforeseeable accident. Mm-hmm. That's why I was pushing it, right? Was the uh, this idea of establishing the driver as a pro. I use GridWise. I put myself into a situation where I'm absorbing data and getting better at what I do for a living. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, if you are, as a passenger, are able to see that this person is not, is, is serious about what they're doing, even if it's part-time, which most drivers are part-time. Right. They're making the most most of their time. If, if they're using other tools out on the road to perform and provide this service, it helps you feel more comfortable. I think Absolutely. anything, any kind of kit that you could provide that helps the passenger, you know, have that a better sense of trust at a quicker pace happen uh, is, is helpful. Um, I will say that the, you know, Uber, Uber specifically has done a pretty good job of implementing some new features into their app to to try to give you a, more of a, a provider reputation around you know this this person's activity. How many trips have they taken? I right. mean, you've everyone's seen the star ratings, uh, but allowing no, them but to I've fill seen, out the, the bios the and, and things of that sort. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like five thousand trips tells me this person is probably not holding people up at gunpoint, right? <laughs> But it doesn't tell me much more about how they operate their business and the fact that they have just gotten, they've been very successful in not being kicked off the platform. Yeah. Right. That's all. And Mm -hmm. and you know, as, as I looked at it, I thought, you know, that, that'd be an interesting thing for us to talk to because driver adoption has got to be something that is very near and dear to your heart as evidenced by your weird answer when I asked the question. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, if somebody wants to sign up for the service, they go what to the Apple store, the Android store, wherever they wherever their phone you know gets software from. Yes? Yeah, wherever their phone. I mean, you can for uh, their mobile apps downloading the apps. They can go directly to the website at gridwise.io and that we'll makes it easy. Route you to the app stores, uh, or you can go directly to the app store, uh, Google Play, or uh, the app store on Apple mm-hmm. on the iOS device, and just type in Gridwise. And you'll That's find cool. It. Um, I really appreciate you coming in. Mm-hmm. I. I wish you nothing but success. If if it comes time where you need a guy that doesn't have any experience whatsoever, I hope you'll remember my phone number. <laughs> I think I, I think I will. All right, that's all we got. Uh, thanks as always for tuning in. Thanks to Ryan and everyone over at Gridwise. We appreciate your time. Uh, all the best, legitimately, all the best for your future success. Uh, Buzzy and I are going to get back in the lab and make another one of these for you. Check it next week on Wednesday morning. Remember, subscribers get it first. We'll catch you next week. The Pitchworks Podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit pitchworks.com. P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.com. On social media, Find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.